What's the deal between baby boomers, millennials, and Gen X? Let's talk about where they come from and who they are so we can get to the bottom of this and talk about housing. You're probably wondering, what does this have to do with anything regarding real estate? Well, I mean, maybe you're not. Maybe you already know that there's a lot of tension between the generations because, honestly, we want a lot of the same houses. So that's why I think it's an important topic to talk about because it can help us strategize when we're going to help find you a new home. So let's talk about who these people are, okay? First, we have um, the question of where these names come from. How do these generations um, come to exist in the first place? I mean, the names for the generations. How does that even happen? Well, obviously, it's crowdsourced. Over time, The there's a book or a magazine or a movie or, you know, some media of some sort describes a generation in a certain way, and then that tends to stick over time. For instance, most generations are called Generation X at some point until we know kind of what name is going to stick, right? So for baby boomers, really, it kind of starts with Time Magazine in 19, the 1940s. Uh, I'm not going to be real tight with my facts, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase here for you, but in the 1940s, Time noted that basically Hitler was in real big trouble because of this baby boom generation. There were going to be so many American baby boomers coming to the front that Hitler was going to be really sorry. So that's kind of the first time the baby boomers were mentioned. And then later on, it came to be sort of uh, congealed or set in stone when um, some of the authors of their day were writing about the generation referring to them as baby boomers. So uh, that's kind of how the, the boomers got started with their name. As far as Generation X goes, well I just told you that Generation X is kind of a, a nickname that every generation starts out with at some point. But uh, in this case, Billy Idol, right? Billy Idol, did you know Billy Idol had anything to do with Generation X? Well. I bet you these guys have no idea Generation X paved the way for them. Billy Idol was given a book from uh, a garage sale and he uh, really loved that Generation X was kind of the, the word that was used for generations. So he took that and he ran with it. He put, um, he put that as the name of his first band was Generation X. And so that was kind of the first time Generation X was used to describe Generation X. And then down the road, it was, you know, a book of some sort. It was, um, I think it was a book called Generations. Um, you can look into that if that's interesting to you. That continued to describe Generation X as Generation X. And that leaves us with Millennials. Why are Millennials called Millennials? Well, basically because they came to college age at the very end of the, the millennia. So they were reaching their last year of high school at 2000, the year 2000. And they got to come of age during the, the Y2K panic where we were all just certain that computers were going to just melt down and we were going to be living in caves again. Or I mean, at least that's kind of how it felt at the time. And there were, there were uh, more prudent 
calmer voices at the time, but you know how that goes. So uh, that's who those different generations are, and um, let's kind of talk about where they uh, they fit on the timeline of uh, our recent past. So uh, as far as baby boomers, they were really born starting in 1946 all the way up to 1964. And then we have uh, Generation X. They obviously they start at 1964 and they go all the way up to 1980. And then we have Millennials. They start at 1981 and they go all the way up until 1994. So um, something that I think is interesting is that uh, Millennials are thought of as small people, you know, 20 year olds or something. But really, if you think about 1994, right now is uh, 2022 so that's that makes them almost 40 years old and they're not 20 anymore they're almost 40 right the youngest the very youngest of them is almost 40 so the older ones wait am I doing my math right life may knock you down scratch that wait a minute scratch that hold it scratch that I do want to talk about the fact that um, we've had a very interesting um, development in terms of housing because a lot of baby boomers um, decided to stay in there well so through the the cycle of buying a home most people buy their starter home in their 20s or at least this has been the sort of the path for baby boomers specifically most specifically they bought their first home in their 20s where it was kind of a starter home, which helped leverage them as they built up equity into buying the next home, where they could have a little more space as they grew a family and had children and that sort of thing. Well, baby boomers have tended to stay in either that second or third home much longer than previous generations ever did. And so what that's meant is that for people in the, in the years below them, the generation X, there just hasn't been the kind of inventory available that there was for, say, the baby boomers. And um, again, um, <laughs> as the pandemic, that, that's been true for the last 20 or so years, but then lately, as the pandemic really took a hold of us and just gripped us, kind of what we saw happening is that that's when people decided they wanted to start moving because they wanted to be um, in the home that was going to accommodate their their now life instead of a future life or a past life and so baby boomers were searching out smaller homes that would often be used as step up homes or first time home buyer homes that a lot of millennials were trying to get into and that's led to a very very fierce market I'm sure you're all aware that during the pandemic we've had um, just wild prices. We've had wild appreciation in Utah. We've had... Hi, honey. How are things in Utah? You go to Utah. You stay in Utah. They want to know what he's doing in Utah. Let's, let's just talk a little bit about the numbers. Um, so baby boomers, like I said, downsizing a little bit later in life than you might expect. And 85% um, have decided, we're, this is in 2019, 85% decided not to sell. Decided not to sell. While Gen X and Millennials are upsizing, right? And that means that we have a shortage. That's where we have this crazy shortage of homes coming from. So I've even uh, read data that we have a shortage now because we all want the same homes, but in no time at all, we are going to have an excess of the bigger homes because of the way that everyone's cycling down into smaller homes. So I guess we'll, I guess more data needs to be pulled on that to really confirm that. But it's you know it's something to to keep your eye on, right? Um, some, some other important numbers that I've noticed, 28% uh, of baby boomers are renters, and this again is in 2019, 28% of baby boomers were renters, and the, the very hottest baby boomer markets 
are in Phoenix, Arizona. They're in Northport, Florida, Miami, Florida, uh, the Villages, and Punta Gorda, Florida. So Florida is really the place the baby boomers want to be. Jake, are you sure this is the place? Looks like this is the place. This is the place. Here? This is the place. Charlie, this and is then the as far as Gen X goes, well, they are um, tech savvy. They're upsizing. Again, 2019, they've been upsizing. They um, do a lot of internet research and communication through email, text, that sort of thing. They spend about two hours a day on social media and that's where they get their news and talk to their friends. And then you also have um, more mo uh, Gen X people using their mobile phones rather than laptops to, to do this with, right? So email, email is really their primary tool. That's the way that they prefer to communicate if they really can get away with it. But they also still very much enjoy direct mail, which I have to be honest, I think everyone likes to get something in the mail, especially when it's not junk mail. It's kind of it's kind of cool to get that. So um, I think uh, we'll continue to see people liking direct mail for quite a long time. But um, Generation X spends a lot of time on Facebook and also YouTube. And they have about 1.5 billion views per day coming just from Generation X on YouTube, right? So really that's that's quite a bit of um, traffic just from Generation X. Moving up for a growing family and storage really defines the Generation X as far as housing goes. They want affordable housing. I mean, I guess, doesn't everyone want affordable housing? But I think it's just very important to them and they, would like a family neighborhood and they want good pay and they would also like to have good education for their kids and um, money for the sake of their future um, they just they want their kids to have a good education where they can um, make more money due to that education so um, generation X tends to save money for their future I need to make more money fast you want to make more money that's why we're here to find out how to make more money i thought you wanted to make more money generation x is known for saving their money uh, they tend to be savers for the future the hottest markets for generation x are going to be houston texas miami florida dallas texas uh washington dc and riverside california so uh those are the spots that most uh, Gen Xers are trying to get to. Baby boomers are 55 to 75 right now, and there are 76 million baby boomers in the United States of America. And as far as Generation X, they are 40 to 54, and there are 82 million in the, the United States. Millennials are 25 to 39, and there are 95 million millennials in the United States right now. So millennials are very knowledgeable, knowledgeable first time home buyers. They understand the repairs and the, the real estate process. They understand renovations. They use the internet and technology to help them understand these kinds of things. They're very uh, technology savvy and they have a lot of access to um, listings and reports and HGTV home repairs and other real estate information as such. So in 2019, agents for neighborhood uh, developments and local market forecasts and local housing regulations and that sort of thing are the kinds of things that millennials are most interested in knowing about. And, and that makes sense because they have all of the data as to how this whole process works. So really what they're looking for is the uh, information that can that, that changes that's that changes throughout time and you need to be constantly updating that information so even though it's constantly changing I am going to talk about I think it's worth pointing out that we did go from 340 to 570 as far as an, a median price in Salt Lake City from 2019 until 2022 October of 2022 
um, as because that's that's a big jump. It's very big. So we want to kind of talk about how we can deal with that and how we can adjust to it to make buying a possibility, especially for millennials who are looking to buy their first time home. It's really important to access all the various resources that are available to millennials to, to make this happen. So that they can also raise their family in a home and uh, realize the American dream. So millennials find a lot of um, reassurance in an online presence, testimonials, um, uh, media profiles, online tools and resources that really show that an agent is engaged in the market and it makes sense because that's where they get a lot of their information from. So again, what does this all really mean? So starting in 2018, even a little bit before 2019, millennials and baby boomers really were trying to get into the same homes. and. So what that means is that they've been wanting um, homes in the 300,000, they wanted homes in 2018 in the $300,000 range, and they wanted uh, walkable, engaging neighborhoods, right? Um, which is really important to know because then you'll know that if you have a, a smaller home with upgraded amenities, it's walkable, and it's in a very engaging neighborhood that the buyer pool for it is going to be very high, right? There's gonna be a lot of people trying to get into that house, and probably your offers are gonna to have to be fairly strong, and there's gonna be a lot of competition there. It's just good to keep in mind. So, like I was saying earlier, 2019 became a very, very hot market for first time home buyers. It was a very um, just intense market for first time home buyers in 2019. There's a lot of appreciation, a lot going on. Really, a lot of that is explained by the fact that millennials were actually kind of coming to a place where they are making uh, more money and they're having families and they're getting married and they. They want a home. They want to be in a home and baby boomers are moving down where they're moving into their first homes and they're kind of trying to get the same home. So uh, the hottest place in the country for millennials has been San Francisco and Seattle, well, Se California, San Francisco, California, have you heard of it? Seattle, Washington, uh, Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas, and uh, Washington, DC. So millennials and Generation X, love Washington DC. Over the next 20 years, there are going to be uh, about 21 million baby boomer homes hitting the market. Okay, so that's, that's a lot of homes to come to market, which will potentially solve a lot of the problems that we've had with uh, a low supply on the market for millennials. One of the issues there is that, as we've talked about, Millennials and baby boomers, while they both want engaging, walkable neighborhoods, they don't necessarily want them in the same parts of the country. So those 21 million homes are going to be spread across places like Arizona, Florida, the Rust Belt, and um, I mean retirement communities really. So um, for Generation X and Millennials, they want cities or suburbs in major metropolitans. They like Wi-Fi and they like walkable shops and restaurants and they, you know, also have a hard time affording them, which is unfortunate, but that's just kind of the reality. So the people who can afford them don't want to live there and the people who want to live there can't afford them, which again leads to a uh, kind of upward pressure on the prices. So as you can see, these things really do kind of tie together because the different generations wanting similar or different things has really impacted the housing market in this country. Specifically in Utah, what that's meant is that in Utah we have a, a tremendous population of millennials and uh, fewer baby boomers and baby boomers who are not leaving the homes that they um, that have been competing for those first time home buyer homes that's that's created a lot of upward pressure on prices and that's why we went from $340,000 to $570,000 as the medium price between 2019 and 2022 October of 2022 um, so 
first time home buyers are paying about 30, 39% more than first time home buyers were 40 years ago, which is uh, according to uh, Student Loan Hero. And, and that's not an insig insignificant number. That's a lot of money. That's, that's a big difference, which has made it much less affordable for a lot of um, millennials. But the rents being almost double what boomers had paid during their years entering the workforce, millennials have had a little bit harder time saving up the funds to buy their first time homes. So millennials are paying about 213% more um, on their student loans, uh, on what they owed for, on what they were paying for an education. And between paying 39% more than their parents were 40 years ago for their first time homes, and also having almost double the cost in rents, uh, and then also paying 213% more for education than their parents did, all adjusted for inflation and all of that stuff. Um, it, it, it's really led to, uh, a, it's been difficult for millennials to buy their first time home. But there are some resources and I would love to talk about those. So let's, let's talk about a few of those. According to Money Mini Blog, one of the best things you can do. Well, he says there are three best things and the first best thing you can do is use a realtor. That sounds very self-serving being that I am a realtor, but he makes a lot of sense in the sense that a realtor knows the market. They know what the price of homes are in the surrounding area. They know how to get you a deal because they know what the, the price of other homes are in the area. So they also spend their time negotiating the best terms and contract on behalf of their clients. This means that having a good realtor is going to make a bigger difference. Who you work with really matters. It's like the difference between having a, a good lawyer and a not the great best lawyer, right? Very similar situation. So use a realtor, that's number one. Number two is take the down payment seriously, right? I mean, let's be honest, these are not groundbreaking suggestions. We all know this, that, that the down payment is going to make a huge difference because the more you put down, the shorter your loan can be. I, let's be honest about getting a loan in Salt Lake City right now in 2022. A 15 year mortgage is a beautiful idea. If you can do it, I really, really recommend it. But the truth is that for most of us, a 30 year mortgage is going to be kind of the norm at this point. But if you can have a, a substantial down payment, what that can mean for you is that ultimately, if you're able to put one uh, big massive chunk of money down in the very beginning, your payments are going to be lower, your interest is going to be lower, and you'll have a much easier time making those smaller payments over a long time. Then once you've made that first down payment that's substantial, you're able to um, add a payment per year in increments. Say it's a you have a $2,000 mortgage, if you're able to put $200 extra in each time, each, each payment, that's almost an entire, uh, well, that's a little bit more than an entire mortgage payment over the course of a year. And if you're able to put an entire um, mortgage payment in over the course of a year, that's going to save you about three months of mortgage payments. And that's, I mean, money is money. I figured money is money, right? Money is money. Well, then with what is time again? Money is money is money when you ain't got it. Yeah. And that's, that's a fantastic thing. So that's the second thing. Number three is going to be uh, the um, idea that paying off your debts is going to be very helpful for you. The less debts you have up front, uh, the less pain you'll experience when you're trying to pay your mortgage on time all the time. The other thing about paying your debts off that's very helpful is that it's going to improve your credit score. When you pay your debts off, your credit score improves. So there is a bit of a process to consider before you buy a home. It's not exactly the kind of situation where you just jump into buying a home and you can just buy it all of a sudden. For the most, uh, for the shrewdest of millennials trying to buy their first home, they will have put together a plan to best approach getting a mortgage and 
figuring out how to pay that off in a way that makes sense for for you really and that's going to be using a realtor uh, taking the down payment seriously and paying off your debts beforehand because if you're able to pay off your debts beforehand your interest rates gonna be better your uh, FICO score will be better and uh, you won't have the uh, albatross around your neck keeping you down when you're trying to make your mortgage payments so I know these are not incredibly um, creative solutions, but they are very foundational. These are the fundamental solutions. So if you're like me and you prefer a little bit more outside the box, because this seems like fairly just common sense to me, let's talk about some other options. Well, one of my favorite money manager blogs is called uh, Savings and Sangria. Love it. The sangria is to die for. I will just have the sangria for now, thanks. My wife makes the best sangria. And um, the, the person who writes this blog, she does a fantastic job of thinking outside the box a little bit in terms of how to best uh, approach your, your finances, right? So um, the her first recommendation, and I could not agree anymore, is that rather than going to your bank for a mortgage, you want to use a mortgage broker. And this, again, is a place where a realtor can come in very handy because realtors know mortgage brokers. They can point you in the direction to the very best one that they like and use. And um, part of the reason that a mortgage broker is going to be uh, uh, the place to go is that mortgage brokers uh, have access to the entire market of lending tools whereas for banks they're limited they have like the one mortgage that the bank does and a mortgage broker can choose from all of these different tools and find the best rate for you it's going that's going to be the cheapest with the lowest closing costs or whatever is the most important to you if you need your closing costs to be less than two percent which is tends to be the standard usually a mortgage broker can help you find a way okay sometimes that will be um wrapping that into the loan and and so that you need a little bit less cash now um whatever the case your mortgage broker is going to be a tremendously helpful uh, place to get a good loan you definitely want to speak with your mortgage broker because they are the financial professional um, but a, a good realtor can point you in the direction of a, a good mortgage broker uh, the second thing that savings and sangria talks about is uh, developing cost saving habits early so it might sound like uh, not a panacea or a silver bullet to develop a cost saving habits before you buy a home, but every dollar does actually count. It does matter. And every dollar that you're able to save right now becomes a dollar later on that you will be able to apply towards your mortgage. If you can get, like we were just talking about a moment, moment ago, if you're able to get an entire mortgage payment in, extra one in every year, that is going to shave off a substantial amount of time that you're paying interest to a lender. It's going to make your your home purchase a lot cheaper. It's it's a shocking amount of money that you're able to save. Um, that's that's the second habit that's very helpful. The third is to uh, a wise millennial is going to embrace the property ladder. What is the property ladder? Well, it's just like. Uh, a physical ladder where you start on the lowest rung and then you move up and you move up and you move up so what that means generally speaking is that you get on that property ladder by accepting that your first home is going to be a smaller home and then from there you're going to upscale strategically so you might be buying a smaller home in an area that's not quite as desirable Although I would say you don't want to buy in an area that is not desirable at all, but it might just not be like the place that everyone wants to be. It's just the place where most people want to be. But you're buying a smaller home and strategically upscaling such that about every five years or so, you're able to get into the next bigger house and the next bigger house until you're in your dream home. You could call it a dream home. Huh? My dream home whatever that looks like for you. 
uh, embracing the property ladder is tremendously helpful because what happens is that as you're paying off your mortgage, you're developing equity while at the same time, you're also developing appreciation on that property. And you're also realizing tax advantages. So there are three reasons to at the very least get started in a small property that is most doable for you. You definitely want to try to uh, afford a mortgage that is below what you're comfortable paying for because that's going to save your bacon in the future and it's going to create a good habit where you are not borrowing more than you're able to pay and uh, it's uh, really going to uh, help you in terms of getting to that final destination where you want to be. The, the last thing that savings in sangria... I'm selling you the sangria. I'm Todd made this killer sangria. Yeah, I had vomited sangria like all over a sweater. <laughs> what it talks about is alternative income. Alternative income is a fantastic way to add to that um, extra payment that you might be able to do every single year on your mortgage. And that might be uh, in addition to having your regular job, you're doing small things like uh, Uber or you've got a blog or you're uh, helping edit videos or uh, whatever your skills might be. They might just be like little things and they might only be contributing a few hundred dollars a month to your mortgage. But as we're speaking about a few hundred dollars a month, month after month after month, year after year adds up. It really adds up. It becomes the foundation to building wealth because savings will never get you uh, really far in terms of financial stability it's always going to be investing and investing happens bit by bit by bit by bit so hopefully this video has been helpful for you in terms of fashioning something of a plan and a strategy to get going uh, as a first-time home buyer and a millennial uh, while or if you're a first-time home buyer I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you'll watch my next video. The end has come. Here at the end of all things. I regret to announce this is the end. And you will beg for death before the end. Is that the end then? Yes. This is the end of the line for me.